What did the Jewish ghettos in medieval Europe and early Christian missions in Australia have in common? The survival of the minority and protection of the minority. In medieval Europe, obviously Jews were the minority and they, had, they were allowed to live uh, inside of their ghettos in Rome, Frankfurt, Venice, Prague, uh, Paris, etc. etc. They had to pay higher taxes to the king or to the queen, who, who in exchange for that financial benefit was protecting them. And uh, they, they, uh, the ghettos were often walled off and they had to be locked overnight and the Jews were not allowed to walk outside during uh, Christian holidays, uh, Christmas and Easter, for example. Now, in Australia, the Christian missions were also places that provided uh, protection and survival for the minority. And the cruel irony is that whereas the Jews had no country of their own until 1950s, the Aboriginal people have been here for 50,000 years, yet they became a minority in their own country soon after the first arrivals from Europe. So that's the connection though, uh, protection and survival of the minority. Now, I'm convinced that without these, er, these Christian missions, there would be no Aboriginal people left today in Australia. So in this video, we will look at these early Christian missions, how it played out in the context of uh, white settlement of Australia. Let's do it. Hi, I am Jan from sustainablebutterflies.com.au. There are five pillars of sustainability that you see on the screen. Now, you might be thinking, how the hell is this topic, Christian missions and Aboriginal people, how is that related to sustainability? And which is fair enough. So let me just give you a little bit of context. Last year I did a three-part inquiry into how or if there is some common ground between Christianity and Aboriginal culture, right? I'm not going to go into why I did that and what were the findings, uh, because that, that's not the point here, but the inquiry is linked in the video description, so if you're interested, have a look. It's got links to four interviews I did with educators and teachers and lots of uh, references and uh, questions, etc. Now, one of the teachers involved in the inquiry recommended to read the book called One Blood, 200 years of Christian and Aboriginal encounter in Australia. And I only finished this book recently because it's, it's a thousand page long book. It took me a long time to read it. And that book, well, that inquiry, but that book in particular, completely changed my view on Christianity. And it also changed a little bit my view on Aboriginal people. And I, it's a fascinating story and I want to share with you some quite surprising, but some quite interesting insights I got from the book. Now, if you like this content, uh, please like the video and consider subscribing because that will make the video more suggested to more viewers so more people can view it. Anyway, you awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, so here we go. The first insight is this. In the late 1800s and then throughout the 19th century, Christianity or religion, but mainly Christianity in the West, had no longer been the main driving force, the guiding principle that would, uh, that would kind of propel the expansion of the Western empires, including the British. That had been the case in the previous centuries, in the 15th, 16th and even 17th centuries, but not after. So what were these guiding principles, these main pillars? Well, scientific and industrial revolution, the idea of progress, uh, and also Darwinism, right? And through those lens, through that lens of progress and advancement and evolution, the Aboriginal people were considered and seen as impediment to progress. They were not even considered human. They were measured, their skulls were measured, they, uh, their arms were measured, their bones, uh, vertebrae and vestigial bones right at the bottom of spine, and obviously they were black. And these, the results of this scientific, this science, which was pseudoscience, 
were used as a justification for the massacres, for the killings and for the atrocities, right? Aboriginal people were also rapidly dying from introduced diseases such as smallpox, but uh, through that scientific uh, Darwinian evolutionary biological lens, it was not interpreted as we brought in these diseases and these people are now weakened, therefore we need to help them. No, no, no. It was interpreted as this, these species are unfit for survival, because the theory of the fittest, uh, the theory, survival of the fittest theory, and they are naturally doomed, right? They're doomed there, and we're just going to assist this natural evolutionary extinction of those species. That was the common view. Now, when the first missionaries came, came over in the early 1800s, and the first mission was established in 1830 in the Wellington Valley, which is in central west New South Wales, they saw the depravity, they saw the massacres, prostitution, alcoholism, and dying from these introduced diseases, and they said, this must stop. And they use this line from the Old Testament. I've got it right here. Now, this one. God had made of one blood all nations of man for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So this verse was like a foot-in-a-door strategy that they used, these missionaries. Uh, they used it to crack this bolted door, actually, uh, that, that opened some kind of path towards a coexistence of the white settler now majority and the aboriginal now minority side by side without the former uh, completely wiping out the, the latter. And by the way, as you probably know, in Tasmania the aboriginal people were almost completely wiped out. Now while that verse, one blood, might imply that everyone is equal and there are other verses in in the in the bible which says like god created man in his image and everyone is equal and all that that though doesn't mean that the christians considered aboriginal people to be equal no 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 they considered them inferior uncivilized and barbaric because because of the curse of ham which is a theological uh, argument, which I'm not going to go into here. They agreed with the, with the progress. They agreed with taking the land and with using the resources and all that. But unlike the, the white settler majority, the sort of progressivist and scientifically minded who are happy to destroy uh, Aboriginal people in the name of progress, the Christian missionaries, they were saying, Progress is fine, we, we can take the resources and all that, but we must save the people. We can't uh, destroy the people and you, the majority, you must allow us to have our missions and protect these people. And that's how they justified the, the first missions. Because again, religion was no longer the big driver of this western expanse of colonialism no 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 it was this it was science and progress and evolution and industrial revolution right the missionaries right from the beginning were stuck between a rock and a hard place and there were many challenges they faced so let's look at some of the challenges number one they were not liked by the majority whether it was police colonial then state government or the pearless sealers, hunters, farmers, graziers, pastoralists, gold diggers, anyone, right? Because they cared for something that no one cared about. So they were always trying to go as far from the white settlements as possible to establish their missions, right? Uh, why? Well, because the white settlements meant uh, alcoholism, prostitution, death from the diseases and attacks on aboriginals, right? But this was quite hard 
because this settlement process was quite fast, right? And as soon as a resource was found near the mission, uh, which often happened, right? Uh, for example, gold. Uh, as soon as the land was sold for farming or grazing or pasture, which often happened, right? As soon as uh, they ran out of money, which often happened, or as soon as they ran out of aboriginals, unfortunately, which often happened, right? Because they died out, uh, they had to move away to even further location or they had to close down. The second challenge was the actual environment and climate of Australia, which is not exactly the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, long distances, uh, deserts and droughts, unfertile soil, uh, tropical diseases, malaria, mosquitoes, uh, venomous snakes, crocodiles, uh, rainforests in far north Queensland, or swamps in the Northern Territory, a harsh and hostile environment. The third challenge was the lack of funding. The earliest missions were self-funded or helped by other Christians. Then they got a small subsidy from the colonial and then state government. But oftentimes, after a few years, the funding would stop. Why? Because the early missions were struggling. They weren't doing so well. Uh, they either ran out of people, Aboriginal people, um, the missionaries themselves died. And also, they were not achieving quick and mass uh, conversions of, Christian, of Aboriginal people to Christianity, right? Unla and this was kind of seen as a di big disappointment. Because unlike the other Southern Pacific nations, such as Fiji or Papua New Guinea, uh, that, are, that are islands, so people can't run away. Obviously, they're not huge Australian continent of nomadic people. They were islands and the conversion of the village chief in these countries meant that the whole village, everyone else in the village, is converted. But not in Australia, because the Aboriginal people had a different structure of their society. So they were doing really badly in the beginning. So a number four is actual set of challenges. Uh, we're going to look at few because these are the challenges that I found the most interesting and these are the challenges that resulted from the daily, daily encounters between the missionaries and Aboriginal people. So let's, let's look at few. So the biggest priority of the missionaries was to get Aboriginal people to settle down. They're nomadic hunters and gatherers. But the, Christ, the missionaries believe that once they can get them to settle down, being uh, on one spot, they could then be civilized so that they can then be Christianized. They believed in the principle of civilized first and then Christianized. They didn't, most of them, didn't believe and didn't practice the Christianized first as a means to becoming civilized. So that was their main priority and the main challenge. Their attitude to, towards the Aboriginals was something like, well, we recognize you as a fellow human being, but you are uncivilized and barbaric and uh, cursed, the curse of Ham, nomadic, hunter and gutter, and we, the Europeans, we will teach you, we will show you the right way to live and we will uplift you from your cursed nomadic state. That was the general attitude. The central pillar of Western lifestyle is work. It's also material goods, uh, education and settled life uh, around the farm back then, right? Was we talking 1800s. So uh, there were many instances on many missions where the, Aborig where the missionaries tried to get people to settle down on a farm and it almost always, it, in the early days, almost always failed. For example, uh, the, there was a Serpentine Lagoon mission in tropical Queensland where they found a good soil, wet, muddy soil, and the missionaries planted rice. And they wanted uh, the Aboriginal people to till and plow the field and plant rice over and over on the same farm because that's the right way to do farming. But the Aboriginal people didn't, didn't understand. They didn't understand 
why would you work hard to plant rice where you can just harvest yams that grew naturally in that same soil and then once the yam season is over they were they went somewhere else to harvest wild berries and then they went to somewhere else to hunt turtles or whatever else was in season and can come back for yams so that that was complete clash bit clash of civilizations this farming example nicely ties in with the social hierarchy. The Europeans considered themselves socially superior and they considered Aboriginal people to be inferior, right? Uh, again, there is that theological curse of hand involved, which I'm not going to go into here, but uh, whether it was tilling and plowing the fields, they they thought of that as being civilized and hunting and gathering uncivilized. And the Lutherans even wanted Aboriginal people to call them master and be the master, be on the top of the social hierarchy. But Aboriginal people, they refused that position. They refused working often and they refused calling uh, these white people their master. Uh, they didn't see how what they were doing is any better to their way of life. They refused to exchange their freedom for the life of what essentially was indentured servant or peasant labor, right? Uh, when they did work though, and they often did, it was out of uh, a pity they took on these poor white people who were breaking their back, which Aboriginal people didn't, didn't understand at all. It was out of compassion, it was out of friendliness, or if they were hungry or wanted tobacco. Now, because uh, getting Aboriginal people to settle down was such a big deal, without which nothing else then could follow civilization and Christianization, which is the point of the missions, right? To Christianize people. They were always trying to find some kind of hook, some kind of incentive, some kind of stimulus, some kind of desire that they would create in Aboriginal people that would make them stay on one spot instead of being nomadic hunters and gatherers that they had been for tens of thousands of years, right? So because Europeans or Westerners, they value material things and as a status symbol or as possessions, uh, just to use for possessions, they value them so highly, they tried to offer houses and clothing to the Aboriginal people in exchange for staying on one spot, right? But it backfired because Aboriginal people they don't value houses or clothes. The only thing that they valued was food, tobacco and tools such as knives and axes uh, that, that would immediately satisfy their wants, like food, right? Or that, that would enhance their traditional lifestyle, but not change their lifestyle. They didn't want that. They were happy living their life. The author of the book, uh, Harris, makes an interesting point. He says that while Australian Aboriginals were, it was quite hard to get them to settle and convert them and all of that, they didn't like material goods and European lifestyle, the Maoris in New Zealand, on the other hand, were quite more open to the different European lifestyle, were happy to change their way of life or, or becoming Christian and, and civilized and Europeanized uh, in that way. And, uh, and uh, sometimes even the missionaries in Australia moved to New Zealand and elsewhere, uh, such as Marsden, and they sometimes what they say is quite comical. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to read it out, but I wrote a few reviews and I'm gonna, I've got a few articles lined up. So if you're interested in this, anyway, subscribe. There is a link in the video description and I can send you these articles. And then there are the actual belief systems of the Aboriginal people and the Bible, right? And surprisingly, at least to me, there were many parallels that Aboriginal people saw, especially in the Old Testament the wanderings of Israelites for 40 years in a desert and fighting, fighting snakes, 
the wanderings of other tribes in the desert and establishing sacred sites, the old law of a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. They are related to, because it's similar to the strict uh, tribal laws, right? The rituals, uh, Aboriginal people are the people of ritual, and uh, they loved the, uh, the rituals, the church rituals, hymn singing. The, the idea of the creator, the divine intelligence and spirit, and uh, supreme being, uh, they related to, because uh, the northern New South Wales, they have God called Bayame, or supreme being called Bayame, and that word Bayame translates as to create. And also, and the, the author actually highlights this, the book of Revelation, which I've got to admit I haven't read. I'm not very well versed in the biblical scriptures. I just have to say it. It's true. Uh, I, I will probably read it at some point. But he says that the book of Revelations is full of dreaming and also struggling and fighting for justice, which the Aboriginal people really, it resonated to them because they could see the parallels between the, the dreaming, the emphasis on dreaming. But there were parts of Christianity that didn't gel with Aboriginal people, especially the consciousness of sin and guilt, which is central uh, for Christian people, right? The idea that I have sinned and that I am guilty, and uh, through the faith in Jesus Christ, uh, uh, who, who was the ultimate redeemer, I can be forgiven and then uh, I can find salvation through repentance, that, that kind of thing. That didn't gel with Aboriginal people because they didn't feel sin. They did uh, sinful. They didn't feel guilty. They didn't understand what was wrong with them. Why they should uh, be judged before God, that kind of thing. They were quite happy. So now in summary, the biggest takeaway I got out of it, apart from what I shared with you, that it changed my view on Christianity and Aboriginal people and all of that, these examples. The biggest takeaway for me was this. When these settlers were coming to Australia 200 years ago, they were thinking, they were the progressivists, they were the modernists, they were the scientifically minded and uh, rationally minded, uh, pragmatics, right? So uh, situational pragmatics. We have this new land, we have to get resources quickly now while it's available, let's grab it, let's develop it, uh, let's do it, right? They had the new uh, Darwinian theory and then through those lands they rationalized, they look at these Aboriginal people, well are they even people? Probably not, based on this new uh, theory of survival of the fittest. We can just get rid of them and keep going. It's quite linear, narrow, focused view. So that was back then. But let's bring it to today. So it's only 200 years from then. Let's maintain, let's, let's use this lesson and maintain some kind of peripheral vision. I love digitization. I love modernity. I love uh, the internet and technology and all of that. It's, it's amazing, right, what we're able to do. But... Let's not forget, let's not be like these uh, new settlers in Australia in 200 years ago who were really narrow-minded and just focused and so sure of their right worldview so that they needed the missionaries who came with quite old-school verse from old-school book that not that many people cared about anymore back then even 200 years ago, that was not e that big deal anymore, religion, uh, unlike in the previous centuries. But, but they, because of that, what the missionaries did back then, in the context of this sp spread and progress and evolution, right, and all of that, they saved Aboriginal people, the oldest continu continuous uh, society and culture in the world. So I think that's very important. Let's not forget. Let's also keep uh, perspective and value, uh, value like deep thinking and traditions and uh, 
maybe if not religion like denomination just like these ideas right that's so important because it's easy very easy to be uh, seduced and persuaded by the scientific and and uh, this rationalist this progress but it's so limited it's really shallow and it could be even lethal brutal right so anyway that was the biggest takeaway for me and you have a great day bye